So the first question that we're going to think about and address here is the overview, kind of like the 50,000 foot view, I guess, of social networking platforms and technologies used to access and promote progressive media. So we've got things to consider like hardware, software, applications, Facebook, Twitter, Google Groups, SoundCloud, YouTube, chat rooms, mobile. First of all, I just want people to know, don't be overwhelmed by all of this new technology because uh, people are finding ways of using it um, in a very independent, customized way for themselves. So just because everyone else is using Facebook and you know, all your friends are tweeting all day long, it doesn't mean that that's what you should be doing. Although I think our culture tends to, to teach that we all need to conform to these new technologies immediately by the latest new iPad or whatever. But in reality, uh, once you filter through all of these new technologies and platforms, what you find is that everyone is finding a very individualized way of using them. So there is no one way. And uh, that means you actually have a lot of choice in how you can use them or whether you use them. So I would say um, don't be afraid to become overwhelmed by it and don't think that um, Somebody knows everything that's going on because even the corporate people don't really understand it all. It's changing so quickly every day. And a lot of the people like Jacob and Paul? Space Dog. Space Dog. Uh, they are examples of people who have gone online and created their own networks using some of these social networking platforms. And I'll, I'm going to predict, although I can't say for sure, that they probably don't use them exactly in the same way. And I find that more and more. Each person I talk to listens to audio on different devices. Not everyone is using the same device anymore. Uh, of course, we heard Norman Goldman at the last presentation talk about the handheld mobile device, or otherwise known as a smartphone, is becoming the new transistor radio. Well, that's not true with everyone. You know, some people would much rather listen to music on their computer, maybe their laptop. But what if their laptop doesn't have very good speakers, and I don't know any that do, really. Maybe they're really music aficionados and they want to hear good sound, so they're not going to listen to music on their laptop. They want a full-on stereo system with their own amp, and they want to listen to it at home with <coughs> good headphones. So everybody's got a different style in terms of uh, platforms and technology. Some people only want to listen to music on CDs and on their CD player. Some people, you hand them a CD these days, they don't know what to do with it because they listen to everything on their computer. And that's becoming more and more the norm. Um, and so all of us actually have been working to develop these kinds of uh, networks online using these social networks. And you mentioned a bunch of them that pro people probably don't know about. So I'm just going to throw a few words out there that might mean something later, but um, of course we all know about Facebook. Um, so a lot of people are using Facebook not only to organize news networks and to share news stories, but to organize whole political campaigns and um, activist uh, movements. Um, we all know, or we least, we've heard about Twitter. Twitter was invented for people to use on their cell phone. So they're short messages. Um, it's specifically a technology that was developed for your cell phone. So you could send really quick messages to a bunch of different people or see other people's messages whom you might be interested in. So like maybe you are you like to follow Chris Hedges and his journalism. You can follow his tweets on your cell phone and if he has a new article out, well, hey, there it is. It's on your cell phone now. Um, one thing that most people don't talk about, however, uh, and I'll throw this in here just so we remember. The latest studies have shown that in terms of social networking and reaching out to the most people in the most efficient way, email is still number one, regardless of all of these other platforms that have popped up. So as I list them, realize that the majority of people I know at least are using Facebook, Twitter, and email. And email is more effective for many reasons, and we can talk about that later. Uh, but all of these are meant to support each other in one way or another. We, we talked about Google Groups, which is a way that you can actually talk with other people on the Google platform. You can even have video conferencing now. It's getting really sophisticated in terms of the interactivity that is available online and 
what you can do if you have a webcam. You can actually start a Google group. You can even do this on YouTube and other places where you can uh, have video conference calls with people around the country, maybe family. Um, there are other platforms like SoundCloud, which are specifically geared towards audio. So you won't see any video there. It's all for people who want to listen to good audio usually. But journalists like myself use SoundCloud because people do kind of go to SoundCloud like a radio station. Um, it doesn't have programming that's specific to any period of the day. It just has people who post things all day long and you can go to any one of their sites and listen to anything they do. So in my case, I um, oftentimes post recordings of programs where I've been interviewed and or where I've interviewed someone. And it's just an opportunity for people who are interested in my journalism to listen to that interview. However, I also do that on YouTube. Um, so the main platforms that I'm using are Facebook, Twitter, uh, and YouTube and SoundCloud. So I have tried to limit them to a small number because there are hundreds of social networking websites now. And they're international too. So you you know there there are specific ones for China and Japan. There are, there are um, an incredible number of them. And after a while, it does become sort of redundant. You definitely don't need to be posting everywhere. Even if you're a journalist or an artist or a radio broadcaster, you want to get the word out. Um, chat rooms. That has to do with your watching maybe now live streaming video of your favorite radio personality, say Norman Goldman or Tom Hartman is, is broadcasting today at three to six, so you go to their website, you get to see them on camera, and more and more radio people are doing that. Part of that is because people in the audience out there now, especially the younger generations, want multimedia. They don't want to just listen, they want to see you too. So even if it's just you behind a microphone, they're fine. They'll watch you for three hours straight, just you sitting in front of a mic, that's fine. Um, Jacob live streams his program, which means if you tune in on Mondays between four and six Pacific time, you can see him behind the microphone and he's doing interviews with people over the phone, but you get to see him and, and it's like he's in your living room. So when I met Jacob, he looks totally familiar to me because I've seen him so many times online. Um, the other ones that were mentioned, like Mumble, Mumble is actually a specific server, a specific network of computers have been set up for people to use for conferencing. So it's kind of like Skype or Maestro, where you can get five, you know, it's like the old fashioned uh, party line. You can get 10 people on the line with you, and you can talk through your cell phone, or you can talk through a mic like this through your laptop or computer, either way. Um, but Mumble is a way for people to gather online in big rooms where, say you're just bored or you want to find someone who's interested in a certain subject, you go to the Mumble server and you put in your password just like all these other platforms and you'll see rooms and in this room they're talking about independent progressive media. So all you do is you click on that and now you're in the room. You can hear everyone that's talking and you can interact with them either through your cell phone or your computer. So a lot of people are doing that. There's also a, a number of others, like newer ones that have just come out, like uh, or that are recent, like uh, Shoutcast and Icecast and all these other things that people are trying. Tumblr has been around for a long time. One big one is called Reddit, and a lot of people have been using that for years now. And what's surprising is some of these platforms are very, very simple. They're not really very fancy looking. They're, they stuck to their, like Reddit, they stuck to their original platform, which wasn't very sophisticated. But people like it, so they stick to it. But just to respond in terms of, um, I'm going to turn the mic over, but just in terms of uh, the platforms, you have your cell phone, your smartphone, you can listen to audio, you listen to the radio, you can see the video live streaming when, when Jacob is on the air, say, or you can go to Space Dog Radio and see the videos that he has posted there on your, on your phone. Um, or you can do all this on your desktop at home. Or you can do this on a laptop that you can take with you, or a, an iPad, something small. So it's available on all of those different platforms. Um, and the ones that I use, and that's all I guess I can say about the effectiveness or, or how it's helped my journalism, is uh, Facebook, YouTube, 
Twitter and SoundCloud. So SoundCloud, I'll put up the audio. There is no video. It's just for people who want to listen, just like listening to the radio. But it's accessible 24 hours a day. Anyone can find it and listen to it anytime they want. YouTube, I put up the audio if it's a radio program, either with the video of the live stream of the host behind or in front of the microphone, or I will just create a slideshow. So I'll show photos of the people that are being interviewed and the host and maybe photos of the issues we're talking about or the people we're talking about or in the news. So you get to listen and you can watch the, the, um, the video, but a lot of it is actually some uh, information. It, you know, a, a storyboard will pop up or a, a text will pop up saying, you know, here's the website they're referring to. Um, so that's a different style of doing it, but a lot of people like to go to YouTube these days. It's becoming kind of the basis for TV for a lot of people who just don't watch anything else. They just go to YouTube because there's millions of videos and you never run out of something interesting. And you know, I mean, you can watch the old Rawhide episodes on television. I've watched all the Untouchables episodes. They're amazing, really well written and acted, but um, you can find those on YouTube. And if you try to get that through Netflix or Comcast or something, you may have difficulties or it might cost you money. Um, bottom line, Everyone needs to find what they're comfortable with. And if it's only one, if they only like to do Facebook, you can talk to your family, you can post things to your friends. Uh, if you only want to do Twitter because you use your cell phone all the time so that works best for you, <coughs> don't worry about all of the millions of different social platforms or all of the propaganda and advertising coming at you about what you should use. Just explore yourself, talk to your friends. What are they using? Listen to people who broadcast, you know, because they'll show you at least where you can go and find their stuff. And uh, in terms of effectiveness and why people use it, and we can talk about that more later. First of all, thanks for everyone who got this uh, forum together and everyone here tonight. It's really great. This is a great uh, possibility for everyone, so I appreciate that. Um, in terms of social networking, uh, Mark's absolutely correct. There's a billion, trillion things to look at out there. Uh, and we had to choose what we were going to focus on. And I think when it comes to social networking, that's also got to be the case. Um, because once you have a, a focused content on a focused platform where people know it's going to be happening, then that cuts out a lot of the clutter. Uh, we've chosen SoundCloud, YouTube, and Twitter for our, for our fast-paced uh, documentation. Of course, we have our own website as well. Uh, but as far as Twitter, and we've seen the effectiveness of this uh, with all the, the worldwide po political items that have been going on. It's now not only just a, a social network, it's a political network, and it's very fast-paced. So it's a very highly effective. In terms of um, you know the technologies involved, now we're not only dealing with you know laptops and cell phones, we're also dealing with uh, tablets of all types, and there's gonna be more of that. So as each person has their own technology, then they can choose what platform. But to, to really have an effective uh, message, I think that uh, the progressives need to have a focused content and make a choice and stay with that choice. Yeah, I would, uh, first of all, thanks again for everyone for being here tonight. Thanks again for the opportunity and uh, to Progressive Radio Northwest for putting it on and having us. Um, I would add that I believe, I would argue, the most important platform that we have in today's world to access progressive media is the internet. I think we're really talking about transitioning from you know going to the radio dial, um, KPTK, KPOJ, Green 960 is not there no more. So I think really the internet really is the most important platform for progressive media. And I mean the corporate control dictates 90 plus percent of the public airwaves. And so we do have to seek viable alternatives that we can trust, I think the uh, right now the easiest and cheapest solution to that is to begin to transition ourselves from traditional media outlets, which are clearly no longer serving in the public good, to social media, to independent media and content online. And you're seeing lots of examples of progressive media existing and maintaining sustainability independently online, independent journalists, independent broadcasters, um, and it's all online, Twitter, Facebook, um, and I would, I would just add that um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bittersweet thing that anybody can be the media, 
um, with a smartphone, with a computer, with a laptop, with your cell phone, with a tablet, anything with a webcam, a microphone, and the internet, you are the media. Like, like we were talking about, I use Ustream, it's free, live stream, spreecast, all free broadcasting um, software that's available. And the opportunity is there for those who are passionate enough, who are determined enough to engage in real investigative journalism, to engage in real progressive media and truth telling. That opportunity is there. We can do it and we can sustain it through listener support through local business support and do it online so i would just add that um, it's very important to to begin to transition ourselves from the traditional media outlets and the internet really in my opinion is the most important platform for progressive media all right so the next question we'd like our panelists to contemplate respond to is what are the most effective ways to use social networks to find and interact with a progressive audience? I, what's interesting is I think we, we have covered some of that actually. Um, it, it's a big question. I, I just uh, applaud Jacob for bringing up the fact that this is a big transition period because we didn't do much to give you context on that point, but it is. It's a huge transition period for media. That's why it is confusing even to the people that are creating it and even to the corporate folks who are, who are developing this software. Nobody really knows where it's going, but it's definitely going more and more online, which means once again, your, what, I, what I call your handheld mobile device. And to me that includes tablets, pads, cell phones, whatever, that you carry with you in your pocket. Um, and as the technology gets, uh, grows rapidly, uh, smartphones soon will be your computer. You won't need, a lot of people don't use laptops anymore. They use their smartphone because they can check their email, they can do all their social networking, they can listen to music. Um, now, if you really are doing production work or you're an artist or something and you really want that big screen and you need to see all the details, of course, there will always be people who do that. And I'll continue to do that. When you're recording music, you do that because you want to see the waveforms that you're getting down to the millisecond on, you know, and see everything that's happening in the music. But for most people, it's going to be your, your cell phone and it's going to be online. So all of this media that we have listened to for years on the quote radio and even on the quote television, both of those terms are becoming slightly outmoded because a TV, literally a television, is literally that cathode ray tube with all that lead and cadmium and nasty stuff that you used to sit in front of and radiate yourself with, you know, that we all grew up doing. But that uh, has gone on to the computer so that now you can watch anything that you want to see that you could see on television or that's already been broadcast on television because a lot of it is now archived on your computer so you don't need a TV. Radio and TV uh, are difficult terms to use now because in reality it's multimedia which means it's all of that and any one of us can do it just like Jacob was saying any kid on a skateboard going down the street with a smartphone can now be a journalist. He can film and I've done this with my own video you can film a breaking story and post it, or in my case, be a stringer for a network and you know, sell it or give it to them, and now you're a journalist. But all you need is a way to capture the audio and the, and the video, hopefully, but either one. So multimedia is where we're at. That's why we're recording this tonight. That's why it's gonna be posted, because um, the world that we're moving into is people wanna choose their programming when it's comfortable f for them. So if, if they, uh, can't make it to that Saturday night event or whatever, then they want to be able to go there the next day or something and see what happened, or later when they get off work or whatever. So that's what we're doing tonight, and that's what a lot of these social platforming, uh, social networks are about, these platforms. It's about taking something that's been, that's happened, like Alternative Radio is an example. They rebroadcast speeches by Noam Chomsky and all sorts of wonderful people. So maybe you weren't at the University of Washington when Noam Chomsky was in town that day, but you can go to their website and you can listen to a speech he gave six months ago. So 
it's a way of archiving and documenting what's going on and it's becoming more and more multimedia where it's not just about uh, audio it's about being able to see and hear it at the same time and maybe writing an article about it too so you have text you have audio and you have video and with the devices and the technology anybody can do that now as far as the most effective ways um, I think I, I already sort of addressed that in the way that I use social networking so we're this is a give and take where we as producers of content are using social networking to get the word out to you so that you know what we're doing you can follow us on Twitter or Facebook or go to our website and see the live stream but you as an audience are also seeking this kind of programming and these days so much of it has gone online and the networks are not very strong yet linking everyone together which is something that you know I hope this um, group keeps discussing is the, it's what's really happening with these networks but um, you need to be able to find it too and that's why we have Twitter and Facebook and SoundCloud and these other places that you can go to to find who's doing what um, and that's the audience trying to find it through the social networking and interacting hopefully you know with the people that are creating the content and then the producers of that content also trying to reach out to you so it's a two-way street that's why it's interactive and that's why it's called social networking because it's not just uh, the guy behind the microphone shouting at you, it's actually a lot of it is you using these platforms to find and to tell other people about it, which is what's so important about progressive media because it needs word of mouth support. There aren't any multi-million dollar advertising campaigns for any of this programming. And I can tell you people are struggling. It's really tough to, to do this. So we need to definitely um, develop new economic models for that, which is another topic, but it's based up. Right, I think the key words here are uh, find and interact. Um, and this is the difference where independent journalists and broadcasters can really make a difference. Uh, number one, finding an audience is tough. We do a lot of walking around festivals and meeting people first, firsthand and interacting with them on Twitter, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so our audience has grown internationally on really important topics. And those are topics that hit close to home, whether it's uh, someone in Melbourne, Australia saying, gee, I didn't know that was going on because we never hear about it in Melbourne, Australia. That's why they come to Space Dog Radio. Or, you know, the, the things going on in Ukraine or the things going on right now in also Washington State. It's finding those people and filling a need and interacting with them in a much more personal level. And I think that's the difference between, you know, a progressive audience and maybe a, a corporate audience who either wants to choose between the Costco of radio or the Walmart of radio. You have your two choices. But when you're a progressive listener, you tend to seek these things out. Maybe you stray from PBS for a while and you, you hear some different programming, which you'll really like. And so those are the things, once you have that listenership or that uh, audience, is following up with that interaction. And for some of us that have zero marketing budget whatsoever, um, it's that face-to-face -face that makes the difference. It really is. And it's also bringing true content, uh, not only finding them, but interacting with them as far as true content. And that's what we try to do at Space Dark Radio. I would add uh, to this, what are the most effective ways of using social media, social networking um, with a progressive audience? I have found in my own personal experience uh, on my program, um, uh, images. It's obvious that we're shifting from a print-based culture to an image-based culture. And I've found just in my own personal experience of using social networking and promoting my show and interacting with my audience that um, any time that I, I use images, it <laughs> uh, the amount of retweeting and, and reposting and liking is just it skyrockets. And um, I would I would mention that I think uh, you know, we are shifting from an image-based culture or from a print-based to an image-based culture. And um, you know, like on Twitter or Facebook, for example, um, there's all sorts of political cartoons. You know, you can. You know, think of your favorite political cartoon. I know you probably just thought of one, and and the 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 ability that that picture is able to illustrate to get across the point, um, which is the the beauty of illustration, right? Pictures worth a thousand words. I think it is very effective in uh, social networking and progressive media and independent media, 
and in mobilizing and educating we the people um, using images, um, political cartoons, illustrations, um, and and you know video and, and audio and. Um, you know, it's just as much faster to look at a picture than it is to read an article or to listen to a news report. So, I would just add that to uh, the effectiveness. Well, our next question actually had two parts, and I think the second part is one that I would like to launch into, and that's thinking about where this is going. What's the future? What could the future be in terms of all this technology? You guys that are really up to your necks in it might have some ideas that we would really like to hear. So let's think about where this is going. Uh, I can see if you extrapolate what the, the current trends that it, 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 the extreme conclusion would be that everyone will have their own TV show now. <laughs> because it's possible. And maybe that'll just become a part of, you know, how a lot of people have Facebook accounts now, maybe they'll have their own TV channel to count. I don't see any reason why that can't happen. Uh, Andy Warhol said that everyone would get their 15 minutes of fame in the future. And uh, was it Malcolm McLaren said that it's, uh, the, the medium is the message. So we're getting to that. They were, they were, they saw way far ahead then, and we are actually now transitioning into a period where that's becoming a reality. Um, generally, people uh, and the, us producers are, are a little bit behind the curve because the technology and this, the engineers are way ahead of us. But that's typical. Sometimes a platform is released or a technology is released and it doesn't, people don't really start to take advantage of it for years. So all of this technology has actually been around for years. It's just that people have, have had also maybe a, a hesitancy to become media makers because it kind of puts you out there in the spotlight a little bit. Um, uh, everyone's going to be watching, as I said, medium on something that they carry with them. So whatever they call that in 10 years, we'll, we'll, it'll be mobile and we'll be able to take it with us. Maybe it'll be you know a card at that point, I have no idea. Uh, there's another element to this, and that has to do with social networking uh, and its ability to free up the press, because now we're talking about citizen journalists. Now that is, could change things, because uh, right now there's kind of a lock on the media. The FCC regulations are very pro-corporate media consolidation. Um, we're going through a round of that now with the Time Warner Comcast merger uh, and at the same time, I always like to say this, Reporters Without Borders lists the United States as 46th in the world in terms of press freedom on their World Press Freedom Index. So if you go to rsf.org, you can see their report. They are an international advocacy group for journalists and what they call netizens, which is people who create media but maybe don't call themselves a reporter. I know someone like that in Hawaii, she's at every city council meeting and recording everything for the community, and she doesn't think she's a journalist, she's just a citizen who's sharing. Um, but sometimes in other countries, especially people who use Twitter to get out information, even though they're not a journalist, um, about what's happening in their country that maybe the government is not so hot on them releasing, just because it's bad publicity or whatever, or uh, those people have been arrested and jailed, and so Reporters Without Borders is one of those groups that is, is kind of trying to keep on the edge of that curve of where journalism is going and what media is now. So they call them netizens. But that means 46 in the world, that means 45 other countries have more press freedom than the United States. It's easier for a journalist to do their job, to get information in 45 other countries, including Namibia, Costa Rica. Finland is usually always number one lately for some reason, but the United States took a big dip back during the Occupy Wall Street protests when the police began rounding up reporters and live streamers, which were just people who had a laptop who would show up at the event and then show everybody else around the world what was going on when maybe the news wouldn't show it. Um, so we took a dive. We went from 19th to 37th last year. 
Um, and now we're at 46, and according to Reporters Without Borders, a lot of that has to do with the treatment of whistleblowers. But there are other issues too, which is the corporate media consolidation, which we all know about, and why a lot of these progressive voices are no longer on the air. So there's a political element to this that we all know about. If you, if you open, if you limit media, then you definitely, there's going to be a political result, because media can affect the outcomes of elections. Um, but if you give this technology to everyone, then you can actually open the door for more truth telling and more um, information, which would hopefully bring us up in the few years higher on that list because there'll be more people who will actually be recording and live streaming things like this and um, sharing it with their friends so that the corporate media can't control all of the information. So I'm hoping more freedom of speech in the future. That's my, go that's my hope. <clears throat> And my hope is the dumbing down of America will discontinue. Um, yeah, so the, the future, um, as far as social networking, I don't think anyone in this room could have predicted what's happened in the last 10 years, let alone in the, in the next 10 years. Uh, but my vision is, just as Mark was saying, you're going to have Google Glasses with different screens on them, and you're going to be moving at 10 times the speed. And if it's not fast enough, people are not going to be taking the time to look at it, unfortunately. I think that is the future. Whereas uh, if it's a focused uh, networking tool, uh, such as Twitter, and you have long time uh, people that are looking at that and really thinking about it, then that could be the future of a real progressive audience and, and, and the audience that we're dealing with now who think now and they'll think of the future. I have a prop for this. I am with Norman Goldman, and I believe that the smartphone is probably going to be the most important tool for the future. Um, I guess I should preface this by saying I've resisted uh, getting a smartphone for a very long time. Actually, my bliss is in like a wood cabin in the middle of the woods with the bears and the fish and like nothing, right? So, um, and the only thing that really convinced me to buy a GPS NSA personal tracking device is the multimedia capabilities of this thing. I can, I can, I've got my high definition audio recorder, high definition video recorder, high definition camera. This thing takes better pictures than the $200 camera I bought last year. And that's exactly why I broke down and finally got one of these things. Um, but uh, as, a, as an online independent progressive media host with a zero dollar budget, I have to use what I can and what is free. And there are many free tools out there that uh, are free at your disposal online. It's, it's all on the internet. Um, as I mentioned, I, I use a program called Ustream. It's just a broadcasting software. Anyone can go to ustream.tv, click on download. It's free. And in a matter of minutes, all you have to do is press broadcast, and you're and you're up on on live. Um, it's not just UStream. There's live stream. There's Spreecast. There's all sorts of things that uh, I'm discovering new things every day. I mean, I'm only I should preference again by saying I'm only 25 years old. This is a completely learning process, uh, just as much for me. And um, Discovering new tools on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, is nothing new. Um, and it's, it's really easy to get overwhelming with everything that's out there. I stick to the basics, you know, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. I mean, that's, that's essentially um, the, the basics. And uh, I mean, I've got, a, I've got a good friend who broadcasts his show on Spreecast, which is like a social media based broadcasting outlet where you can log in on Facebook or log in on Twitter and watch all of the all of the programming on Spreecast. It's all free. Um, and I have I've have I have other good friends who broadcast their online programs directly onto YouTube. They have their own YouTube channel and they just go onto their YouTube channel, they click on broadcast live and they're live on online. So I think the, the possibilities are limitless. I think the tools are um, limitless. There are many out there that are free. And uh, as long as you're motivated enough to create, to produce, to promote progressive media online, uh, it's all there. It's at our fingertips. We just got to do it. 
I think we're going to take questions at the end. Oh, well, that was our original plan. Uh, but I think uh, with a small audience, it is almost 8 o'clock. So I'd just like to inject yeah. something. While you were speaking, I brought up my smartphone here, went to you stream. As you were talking, just kept scrolling through live now, yeah. live now. Yeah. I'm still doing it. Yeah. So my point is this. Um, how do we attract those eyeballs to each individual one of you? Okay. Uh, I sort of know how I'm doing it, but it's still a challenge. And I'm a guy doing the whole progressive, so nation of change, it costs uh, are some of my regular sites that okay, albeit they're digested, you know, and I get the, the original articles. But they editorialized a little bit and um, you know, we get the charts and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's still a challenge. And I'll just add one other thing I subscribe to those services. So maybe that's one way that's being monetized. I don't know. I would just say I think part of the, the bitter sweetness of this is anyone really can be the independent journalist. And there are so many independent operations going on out there. Mm -hmm that is, is like impossible to, to locate, to find all of them. I didn't even hear, I didn't even know of Space Talk Radio until we organized this event. And we went to the same high school, come to find out with the same radio <coughs> broadcasting program. Just a few years apart. So I, I'm like, I, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, uh, I'm discovering new stuff every single day. Um, I would just say uh, build consistency. Um, Maintain a, a unique perspective, do something that no one else is doing. Maybe it's just filming the local protest at the end of the street that no one knows about. But if you if you do something unique and you maintain that consistency, I think if you build it, they will come, kind of thing. You should have. You really should have gone like that. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, for, if, for people watching the video, they, they probably didn't hear the question, but. Um, well, part of the question, if I re re reiterating correctly, is how can someone in the audience uh, who likes this kind of media help spread the word? And um, one and the, the audience member suggested one way might be by subscribing to these services that he's using right now as we speak um, online to find interesting programming. Uh, th this is the question that we're all dealing with, and that's what this. Uh, is partly about tonight is what are we going to do in Portland? There's something um, called a, a KX Ray Radio, right? mm -hmm. uh, a new um, organization was built there after KPOJ went off the air. They raised what two hundred fifty thousand dollars in like two days on Kickstart, bought a, free, a low power frequency, which is uh, heard in parts of Portland, most of Portland, right? Um, and put some of these progressive voices back on the air. Now they have their own progressive voices in Portland. So one thing you can do is start regionally. Find out who's in your region. I've gone nationally. I mean, I'm talking to people in West Virginia and Florida and Washington, D.C., all over the place who are doing this great stuff. And I have a whole list of them, you know, if anybody's interested. But um, uh, one of the things is that social networking replaces the big millions of dollar corporate ad campaigns. That's called, that's a one uh, effect or, or one aspect of crowdsourcing. So your audience can actually help build the audience. That's new, you know, it's never been done before, really. Uh, the corporations have always controlled everything. You also have models of, you know, maybe this, the uh, listeners uh, are on the board or own stocks in or shares in that network. Um, then they can help promote it. But uh, one thing that people might want to think about is that because I guess, it, well, the reason I said this is because it goes back to we have the tools, but like you said, how do you use them? How do you get people to know what you're doing? Now you can create all this wonderful stuff, so how do you get an audience? All of us talk about that every single day. It's the major number one challenge. And sometimes, you know, you, you get lucky and you get, you know, get to write for Huffington Post or something that helps. But in, in reality, a lot of what's going on is two things. One, people are networking amongst themselves and these networks are starting to grow. Nicole Sandler's network, Radio or Not, um, which is what Jacob's show is a part of, is a website and you can go there and you can find different programs on the sidebar besides the one you're watching. 
which are related, interesting programs like um, Talking Left. Um, some folks like the producers on these programs have gone independent like Jacob, and that's where Talking Left came from. They just said, you know what, we want to do our own show. You know, we produce this other person all the time, let's do our own. Um, so networking on the internet and using social platforms is one way to grow the audience for the people that you enjoy and also for um, the producers themselves have to do that. But we may have to face a shift in our paradigm here, which I've been thinking a lot about lately, which is maybe it's really not that important that millions of people are listening to you. In fact, maybe that's a limitation. Maybe your hands are going to be tied now because somebody's making money. We don't have to worry about that. I'm an independent journalist. I freelance for lots of people, so no one controls me. And when I was with uh, Free Speech Radio News with Pacifica Radio Network, which is hopefully coming back, although it went off the air for lack of money, not for lack of an audience, um, I was paid by a group called Reporters Against Censorship, you know. So we were independent, independent foundation, okay. Uh, th there are ways of keeping your independence. The question is, how do you uh, create a model that you can retain your independence but also create some income to keep yourself going and to upgrade your new computer that you need now um, to keep on the air. So that's where Kickstarter campaigns come in and a lot of other their subscriptions, a lot of programs. Uh, Norman Goldman is doing this, you know, $5 a month. You're a subscriber. Now you're helping keeping him, him on the air. Bob Kincaid is an amazing uh, commentator out of West Virginia. And I, he's got something called the Head On Radio Network. He's very independent. He actually asks people while they're on the air, would you be willing to, to donate some money tonight? We need a new transmitter or whatever. We need $150. Is there anybody out there who's willing to do it? And nine times out of ten, his listeners do it if they and there are a few people who told me when I was on his show that they do that quite regularly you know they're not necessarily shoveling out money every night but if he really has a need his audience keeps him on the air it does remain this question though uh, is it important uh, or are we more effective being independent and being a little bit under the radar which kind of helps sometimes um, in order to get this information out to the public, in order to tell the truth, is it maybe better that we keep these as small networks? Because one of the questions I have in my mind is what happens when we become the next Fox? You know, I mean, what happens if we build a network and people are throwing money at us, like, you know, who knows, BP or something, and then you have to face that crossroads, like, uh oh, well, we, do we go for the money or do we go for the truth? Well. One good thing about being independent is that you don't have to worry about that because nobody is paying you to not tell the truth, you know? Um, so the paradigm shift may be for some of us that we have to accept that we have to build regional reputations and we have to build national networks doing exactly what everyone is doing, putting a link to somebody else's show on their website and just saying, now we're a network. That's all it takes. You just find some other programming you really like. And you say, would you like to be part of our network? And they say, yeah. Well, what does that take? Well, that means we put a link on our website to your website with a little icon that says, go to Filter Free Radio, you know? Um, and people are doing that. Now, if you can link those together, those would be like the sub-networks, you know, maybe for now, although they might keep growing. What happens if there's a hub, like possibly the Progressive Radio Northwest website, where you can go and see all these links and you can find all of these people? Well, that in itself is a network now. Nobody's paying to do it necessarily, you don't, you don't have advertising or people buying your programming necessarily or controlling what you're saying, what you just have is a hub, like this building, right, where you can go and get this information, um, but I just wanted to throw that out there that maybe it's not a good thing to be on MSNBC. I mean, I love Rachel Maddow, but uh, I think there's a middle ground. You don't want to be a, a, the starving artist of the, of the media crowd, although a lot of us are. Um, I, you know, I'm able to, to continue my work and sustain myself, but I think that we do need to create some kind of economic models, and maybe they'll all be different for each individual program. Maybe somebody will have subscri subscribers, somebody else will do Kickstarter campaigns, somebody else will have commercials for a local um, green technology business or something. Whatever works for you and your particular community, but maybe the point is not, you know, to become 
number one and have millions of people watching you, maybe that's actually not the goal. Maybe it's actually to find a mid-level where enough people know about what you're doing that you can be effective and change things, at least regionally or amongst progressive radio folks or progressive audio folks. And, th and maybe that's what we should all strive for. Instead of, you know, we want to blow up big, maybe we need to stay, not, you know, get the word out, right? But not sell out. There was another question here, which I think might have uh, some discussion before we take more questions. And that's, um, how do you go about doing your activities? How do you interact with other content providers? How do you recruit guests? How do you produce your programming? You know, what, what, what's it like to actually go through this process today, especially when there's no corporate or company organization around to take care of all the details. <laughs> it's very organic. It's face-to-face, -face. it's phone calls, it's emails. Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, each, as I said before, each individual has a particular platform they like to communicate on. Some of the people that I communicate with will only talk to me on Twitter. Some will only talk to me on Facebook and some refuse to touch those because they don't even have accounts there. They'll only take emails. Few people will only talk to me on the phone or through text messages. So I have to use all of them, but it, uh, for me, I have to use them to set up interviews. I have to use them to get in contact with other people who have their own programs. The producers for those programs communicate with me through all of these um, social networking platforms. Usually we don't talk to each other on the phone until maybe a day before or the day of uh, some interview or something that I do in the media. It's all done behind the scenes online. Um, and part of that is because you can be at a meeting and te you know, text somebody and instead of waiting two hours till the meeting's over or you, you know, to get back to them. You can literally respond immediately. Um, so I use it also to find, just like the audience uses it, to find these different programs. If I want, if I have a story that I'm covering that I don't think is getting any coverage and I really want people to know about it, I'll just start searching for someone, hopefully that someone will let me cover the story. So maybe even people that I've worked for in the past, which often happens, don't want you to write about that anymore or aren't interested in your stories on that particular subject. Go online, use the social networking, check my Twitter account, who's popping up there that I haven't heard of before, what are they talking about? Go to my Facebook site, see who's posting what, um, and my friends and my colleagues are sharing this information on these feeds so I can see when they're posting things if I happen to be on it at the same time. Uh, and so um, I use it for all aspects of what I do. I also use it to distribute what I do. So I use it to set up interviews, I use it to contact media folks, I use it to promote and publish and distribute what I do. And a lot of times in independent media, even if you write for someone, uh, like say I write an article for Truth Out or something, then I feel as an independent and an alternative media type person that I need to help promote that. Especially when you're freelancing. Now if you're a staff writer and you're going to get a salary every week for writing that, for writing your column, that's a different thing. But if you get an article published or you do an interview with somebody that you really admire and you want people to hear this, then you as a journalist have to get on that computer and start telling everyone. Just like you tell each other about new programs or things that you like, I have to do the same thing. So all aspects of it. Um, and the most interesting part of it though is the way it's being used to build these networks. Because that's new and um, it's just cool to be able to uh, I think in the past it would have been really, really difficult to get up to, to develop some personal interaction with the producer for the Tom Hartman show. But in, through social networking, you can actually get a hold of them and you can actually interact with them. That's another aspect of, about this that maybe we didn't talk much about. But social no networking, if you're going to stick to a particular platform, is only effective if you are interactive with your audience. If you just post stuff and then run off, and never respond to anybody's comments about what you just posted, people won't, won't follow you. And that actually is one of the issues being an independent journalist that's very difficult because, especially since I was trained to do headline breaking news stuff, because 
I'm on to the next story. So it, it's not as effective probably for me as it is if you, if you have a program, which I hope to have soon. Um, but if you've got that content that you're providing on a regular basis with, a, with an audience that you're targeting, that's great. I write for all sorts of different people and I go on all sorts of different programs. So by the time something gets posted somewhere, I'm off to the next story and that's just the way it is. That's why sometimes you have to take a break and get away from it because there is no nine to five when you're a journalist. You, you know, there is no vacation. It just depends. Like, do you want to work today? There's 20 stories that are breaking that no one's covering, so it's up to you. Um, so that's the only problem I have with social networking is that I, I, the interaction. Like, if I if I publish an article, people are going to be commenting on that article, and sometimes I forget to go back and see what people are saying because I'm I've got two more in the that I'm trying to send out right now. <laughs> so maybe you guys have a comment about what it's like when you have, actually have a Consistent programming. Consistent programming? I have no idea what that is. Um, you know, a good example of this as far as uh, progressive media, if you look at the, the Occupy movement, okay, I follow a lot of the Occupy movements all across the nation, and there are so many of them, I can't keep up with all of them. I would love to, like the gentleman back there said, I would love to have one Twitter account where I could see all the Occupy movement, but I don't think that's really possible. There's so many of them. So in terms of the progressive media consolidating and staying on focus, I think that's really where you know social media can come into play. In terms of recruiting guests, there's a woman down in Texas, Julia Trick Crawford, and um, she had had her land taken away from her for the Keystone XL pipeline, and it was really extraordinary to get that interview. And so to find out and recruit those guests and to get those unique programs is very, very difficult. Going up to Bellingham, talking about some coal trains down in Portland, talking about the pollution in the water. Whatever it takes, it takes a lot of time. And then to do shows, that's you know maybe a couple of hours to do a, a 10 minute show, but you've got to do the research and you've got to do the writing and it's got to be true content. So again, back to Mark's point, is uh, that interaction really comes into play. And if we had one central hub for progressive networking uh, that everyone could go to and see all these resources, I think that would maximize everyone's benefits. And I think there's people out there like you know Ed Schultz, you know Tom Hartman's uh, obviously a supporter, uh, and and these guys. They would they get on board somehow and and be supportive of that if if we could just consolidate uh, perhaps this is a first step with uh, progressive radio Northwest to get all, all of us at one place uh, and I do think that it is uh, critical to keep that individuality um, you know there's no voodoo donuts in Seattle you don't, you have to go to Portland to go to voodoo donuts. And we love going to Voodoo Donuts in Portland, Oregon, because it's Voodoo Donuts and it's only in Portland, Oregon. And it has books, it's only in Portland, Oregon. So you want to keep that individual you know, focus as far as what you're producing, what you're providing. And I think that um, individual uh, independence for progressive voices is absolutely essential going forward. Yeah, I got hungry for some donuts. <laughs> I love me some Voodoo, the bacon maple bars to die for. Um, they put a piece of bacon on the maple bar, it's just genius. Um, uh, I, um, it, how do you go about creating the logistics to make the independent media show exist? It's just like you'd have a conversation with your best friend. Um, we're just now we have more tools to have those conversations. We can have rather than a face to face where it's, it's in, it might be inconvenient, you might be on the other side of town, on the other side of the nation. Um, they came out with a great tool, the telephone, and that connected people. And now we've got you know the internet and, and, and Twitter and Facebook. It's all just different ways to connect with each other. And it's, it's just establishing the, those connections. I was almost late to this panel tonight because I was speaking with the security fellow downstairs because we were just talking about how I, I got lost and I had to go around the block a couple of times and then we get into the conspiracy on fossil fuel and car efficiency and, and come to find out this guy knows his cars. He knows his car fuel efficiency far more than I do and, and I had to stop and say, can I give you my card, come on my radio show, talk to me and let's have this conversation. Um, and I think uh, for me, anytime that I find something interesting to me, anytime I find something fascinating to me, I, I try to share it uh, with the 
um, kind of the assumption that my my listeners, my audience, my friends would also find interest, um, a similar interest, and um, and that comes back to maintaining that uniqueness and you know being different um, and maintaining a consistency. Yeah, that's a few questions. Go ahead. So, um, did you ever think about um, Is this my one? Yes, it is. Hey. Hi, uh, I'm Don Smith. Um, I've been thinking about progressive media for several years, and I have this website, Washington Liberals. And but the point that I've noticed for years is that there, it, within the progressive world, there are these two theories of how to do politics. One is bottom up, where we, everyone has everyone's a journalist, and we don't like top down organization. We don't like having a boss. We don't like having to follow the rules or whatever. We don't care about money. Um, and, the, and the other is top down. And I, I think we need both. I mean, there, there's value in both of them. Fox News kicks ass. The Tea Party people kick ass. They take 60, they, they got 60 um, Congress uh, representatives in Congress. What did Occupy get? Occupy raised consciousness, but they did not get any, did not vote anyone in office. So anyway, what, um, what I think uh, would I'd like to see in progressive media is to have somebody mentioned this uh, having a website like a, a portal or one place where everybody goes and everyone swallows their damn egos and says we're going to get together we are progressives we believe in cooperation we believe in working for the common good we're not just in this for ourselves and our egos to, to publish and be the big shots we want to take back the country from the forces of um, we, we want to have completely engaged. We want to be able to communicate with each other and have enough um, power behind us and uh, a big enough voice that people listen to us. First, we talk to each other, and then we want to reach out to the public. Now, I mean, Fox News, people watch it, and the power of a top-down organization is, is tremendous. It, it works. We, we need top-down as well as bottom-up, and we need to, for progressives, are all about um, coordinating and uh, you know, the common good and working together, but we don't cooperate as well as the right wing people do. It's, 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 so, uh, I, I would like to see um, the, the progressive, all the progressive media get together and at least be on the same page and so they can have a common sort of um, voice and then they would have, uh, they would have individual voices speaking too, but they, they would need to, to be together for that. And by the way, AM 1150 on the AM dial, um, I forget the name of that radio station, but they, they have, um, they're saying, do you want to have your own radio show? Let's have it. And they have like, psychic people on there. They have Dr. Love on there. They have Chinese <laughs> programming. Does anyone know the name of that radio station? It's AM 1150. And, I, and when I'm, I don't drive much. When I do drive, I listen to that. And um, but they're saying, uh, if you want to have your radio station, please do it. And I, I bet they could have progressive radio. Thanks. That is an interesting point because that is what I can't remember the call letters either, but it's actually what is considered a pay to broadcast station. So for, I don't know, a couple, two, three, four hundred dollars a month or whatever, you can have your own weekly program, that, which you could actually produce in your own. Um, by the way, that's what everybody's doing now. If you didn't know, if you, if you see these live streams of, well, Tom Hartman is with Free Speech T TV now, but Mike Malloy, Norman Goldman, Jacob D, Space Dog. Of course, he's kind of mobile too. He does things all over the place. But uh, Nicole Sandler is broadcasting from her living room. Jeff Santos, who's uh, someone I would highly recommend out of Boston, he's on a, something called the Revolution Radio Network out of Boston. It's an AM radio station in Boston that's trying to get this stuff national. He's very interested, by the way, in what's going on with this group. We've talked about this group on the on the air and. He and the progressives in Boston feel a particular affinity to this area, and so they're kind of watching us to see what's, what we're doing. Um, but he broadcasts from his living room. That, that's an issue we don't really need to talk about. I, you know, personally, I'd rather not let them see my dirty dishes, but that's just my style. Jacob pretty much has a studio sort of set up, you know, um, with lots of logos, too. Uh, and 
I would just say, when I say logos, I mean he's got filter-free radio right there below the microphone and plenty of ways when you see him broadcasting to connect with that program. Some people just, you know, have nothing behind them and it's just a curtain or the window out to their porch or something. Uh, but that is an important point. Sorry, to get, I didn't get back to it immediately. Um, by the way, check out Washington Liberals. It's a very interesting website where people do write some cool stuff and they've allowed me to write there, so I really appreciate that. Um, I, I think that that's one option for progressive radio is to pay to play. It's not maybe the best option, but it depends. Like I said, there are many different ways this can be done. But all it would take, literally, would be donations or a sponsor. They underwrite the show. You find a local... That's what these programs that he was talking about do. Uh, the Psychic Pet, the person may actually have a pet store or something that actually advertises or underwrites their show. So they actually pay for the programming. Then you get to do the programming because you have somebody to underwrite you. It's a public radio model, which is actually being used more by commercial people now. I think Jeff Santos, his program is underwritten by a labor union. Now, as an independent journalist, I don't know. There is a question there, you know, who's paying for this broadcast? Ed Schultz just got in big trouble for that kind of thing, if you if you heard about that. Big, big contributions from the labor unions. and uh, But that's one way to do it. You find a local business, somebody that advertises. I knew somebody who had a program on there for a little while, and it was uh, that shop in Fremont called, uh, I am, or Wallingford called I Am Not a Number or something, where they sell a lot of posters and buttons and things. They underwrote the program. For them, it's cheap advertising. Because if you had to pay for that same amount of airtime on Cairo or something, it would cost a lot more. So it's actually cost effective for someone to underwrite your show. You get to mention them at the beginning, maybe in the middle, and at the end you say, this program was brought to you today by whoever sponsored that show. Um, so that is a very interesting point. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> that's the thing. Is, I was trying to take notes while you're talking, and it is. I, I do want to respond to this. Okay, there is one Occupy candidate who, who was a self-proclaimed Occupy candidate who got elected to Seattle City Council, named Shama Sawant, and she's stirred up a lot of controversy, and she's getting international attention from media all over the world. And it, she's also the can, pretty much started this campaign for fifteen dollars an hour minimum wage in Seattle. At least she made that with her platform when she ran for office, and surprisingly beat the incumbent um, Richard Conlon. Uh, so that's just a minor point there, but it really is true that the Occupy movement generally did not trust the political system. Between the Electoral College and the Citizens United decision, people just said, you know what, if we go into this, we're going to get our hands dirty and we're not going to be able to stick to our principles. Now, that can work or not work. That also happened in uh, Spain during the Civil War where uh, the anarchists, anarchists actually bought, uh, fought the fascists I believe in Madrid and won, uh, when, the, when, the, when they were offered parliamentary seats, they refused. When they were offered a share in power in the government, they refused. They said, we're anarchists, we don't believe in government. Well, the next thing you know, the fascists are taking over. Now, the second time this happened, yeah, they actually said, okay, okay, maybe that wasn't a good idea. Well, we want a few parliament, people uh, uh, representing us in parliament. That's an age-old discussion, especially in the Northwest, about whether you want someone to be your boss. I'm thinking that that comes in uh, when you have a dedicated news network where it's journalism and you have to keep your ethics and you have to follow the Society for, for Professional Journalism guidelines. You do need some edi editors, managers. Uh, independent journalism and independent programming, I think it's... Uh, if you say it's a network or you try to build a network, then you're going to have some top-down management um, unless you are just individuals who connect through this thing called the network, which tends to be what's happening now. Um, whether all of these people are on the same page, now that's a different question because sometimes they're not. So people I've reached out to uh, in progressive media haven't necessarily been that interested in reaching out to anyone else. They're into their own thing. You know, Norman Goldman came here because he's, he wants to push this issue all over the country. Other broadcasters have their little niche and they're not that interested in what other people are doing. They're just trying to keep their show together or they may just not like the style of other people. That's why I said organic because radio or not came together because all of this programming is similar uh, in their 
I don't know what you say, commentary style, their political style. But what you're bringing up is the political element of all of this. Um, where does progressive media come in, where does politics come into that? These guys may have more to say about that. I am trained as an independent journalist not to uh, necessarily promote one side or the other. It's very apparent where my sympathies are, and I make that very clear. But uh, I worry sometimes, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about having a, a program where you, you're having interviews and opinion and commentary. Now, when I start doing that, it may change. But right now, I, I can't really address the political side of it. I, the, the fact is, is that Clear Channel owns 880 radio stations around the country. It's clear, I can say this as a journalist, they have a political agenda. They did this for a reason. KPOJ was sold off right after the election. They have a political ad agenda. Cumulus owns 330 radio stations around the country. If Brad Friedman had a chart, if you, my article at Op-Ed News goes into this, it called Is Radio Dead? Uh, Brad Friedman had a chart on Bradwalk, which showed the red stations versus the blue stations. You couldn't hardly find the blue stations anymore. It's terrible. So just as a journalist, I can say that political imbalance in the media is way off balance, and there needs to be more progressive voices just to even it out. First of all, Space Dog Radio will never be Fox Network, ever, ever, ever. <laughs> Secondly, uh, that's an excellent point. I appreciate you bringing it up, and I, I really do think that, you know, as, as everyone wants to be independent, there's, there comes a point where you have to, you know, be grown up about the business aspects of it, too. And there needs to be some top-down management, there needs to be a business model, and there needs to be effectiveness behind that business model within the confines of being independent. So I appreciate all those things, but we'll never read Fox Radio. Well, being from the bottom, I like to focus on bottom up. Um, that's kind of my where I come from. You know, come from a middle class background with with not much. Uh, but Don, to your point, um, I think uh, the best thing that Fox News has got going for itself is the fact that it's live twenty four seven. Um, I would like to see MSNBC live 24-7, especially on the weekend when they're trying to show repeats of uh, whatever the prison thing is. Um, so, I mean, but they've got the money to do it. They've got the huge corporate uh, backers to do it. And I think that um, the top down that you see, you know, with Fox and the Republicans, it really works with folks on the right because, I mean, I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but I think uh, progressives and liberals have more of a capacity to be able to think for ourselves. And so when we're fed, you know, we kind of stop and analyze and process and then we decide rather than I think um, uh, like sheep just kind of get in line, follow the rule, uh, you know, vote for Mitt, you know, whatever. Um, I, th I think, and there's been lots of books written, lots of reports done on like the wiring of the reptilian brain, the Republican brain. I, can't, I'm, I don't know the name of the books or stuff. There's, there's a lot of it out there. And um, I, I don't think that a top-down approach can work uh, personally. That's my personal opinion. Um, I mean, I think there are aspects of a top-down approach that are needed, just like uh, Space Talk just mentioned. You have to, you know, you have to have some sort of structure. You have to have some sort of plan. You have to stick to a parameter. Um, and, and be responsible about that. But um, I, I think that uh, bottom up is the way to go. I, I really believe in the, in the grassroots, you know, tell five friends, they'll tell five friends, they'll tell five friends, and we're gonna organize the next nonviolent successful social movement. Um, I, I really think that's how it's gonna happen. This is my opinion. Yeah, anybody have another question? Yeah. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm Lindsay. I um, have hosted a couple of radio shows and made a couple documentaries, and now I am the founder of a tech startup that is, I like to say, Craigslist for social change. So no, the goal being no matter what city you're in, you could find all the documentary screenings, protests, political debates in a city. Uh, we are live in Portland and Detroit. I just moved to Seattle a couple weeks ago. Um, so the way it works is it aggregates from other nonprofits or anyone who links to it. So any organization or individual 
can copy the URL of their calendar, put it on our site, and all their events will always show up, tagged by whatever they look, whatever they work for. So it's a super automated, easy way to create a really comprehensive database of the events and organizations and people that work for social change in your community. What's it called again? Activate Hub. ActivateHub.org. So we're only in Portland and Detroit so far. I am looking for people who want to help run the Seattle site. Help the Seattle site means maybe spend two hours a week looking for calendar feeds to import or deleting extraneous things that show up because so much of it is automated. Um, but I call it a calendar. I call it an info database for social change. Personally, I think it's the future of media. Why? Okay, on every event page, uh, there's comments. So people, when they go to a protest or they go to a political debate, um, can have conversations there. And it lends itself to some great first-hand reporting options. Um, as a journalist, when you are, you already mentioned the difficulties in finding guests. And as a listener of Progressive Radio, you often hear the same guests over and over. How do you find other people that are working on issues? So with a database like this, anyone can use it anonymously but people can opt to have profiles, and as they RSVP, it kind of tracks. I want to find out who's involved in gay rights in the city. How do I do that? And right now, if you Google climate change in Seattle, good luck finding the organizations, or the people, or the events, or ways to get involved. Oh, yes, but there is one. Yeah. Um, I also have been doing an Activate Hub Radio Minute in Portland. So we do a weekly, uh, like two minute, here's some of the great activist -y events that are upcoming. Um, of course, I would like to expand that once our Seattle site is up and running to any show that wants to carry it here. And of course, I think you've been talking about having a network for progressive radio stations. If this is the place where you're finding all the organizations for progressive change, I think it's a good place to find the radio stations for it too. No story. And I need help. Yeah. And anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Have you tried to recruit people work here? Yes, everyone's working. They're all, they're totally <laughs> on their own thing, you know, everyone's like the founder of some starving startup here. <laughs> but I've only been here three weeks, so I'm trying to work. Any response to that notion? I would just say, uh, going back to the point earlier of how do we organize, how do we create, uh, you know, how do we find guests how do we establish connections and stuff? I'll tell you right now, I'm so inspired by Lizzie's comment, what she's doing, that I I know that my interests have already worked on the website and everything. I know that if it's piqued my interest, it might pique one of my listeners' interest on my radio show. And so now I'm gonna make it a point to get Lizzie on the program or at least play, you know, some audio of that. I mean, and that is literally, you just witnessed, that is how that happens. And it's just, it's just, all of us are do, we're kind of doing our own thing independently, and somehow, some way, of the paths cross. And it, as long as we do something, and rather than ignoring it or letting it go, or just you know, oh, I should have, could have, would have, do it. Just, just do it. Yeah. I, I agree. I actually think we have an obligation. Yeah. Just because of what I said before about where we are in terms of media and the rest of the world. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's up to people in this country to create the media if it's not being created, you know, in, in an honest, authentic way. And that's one word that keeps coming back over and over, is we're, all these networks that excite me are people who I consider to be authentic. Now, I may not agree with everything they say, but I can tell that they're that they're telling the truth from, from their point of view and that nobody is controlling those puppet strings, which I can't say is true of the Russian laws of the world and stuff. By the way, uh, those right-wing talk shows are losing a lot of their audience right now, so that's the future of radio as well, is that there isn't as many people that want to listen to Sh Sean Hannity or uh, Glenn Beck. They're losing a lot of their audience. Uh, Rush Limbaugh got put on a smaller station down in LA, taken off the big Fox station and put on a, a smaller one. So they're doing that. But those they're paying those guys millions of dollars because they have exclusive contracts. So they're gonna have to keep paying that money for at least a little while. But I would go back to um, what Norm said about that. 
because we didn't address this during that question about the future of progressive radio. There may be a window of opportunity at some point for some of these stations or frequencies to be available to progressive media once the right wingers totally bankrupt them all, yeah. which is what's going on now. I mean, that's something you, you see it with the government, you see it with the corporations. It's another 2008 crash ready to happen in the right wing media. Um, however, on the a progressive side, we don't have as much overhead or as much debt to bain capital in places like that. So I think that there's actually, a, a, will be a better survival rate. But we should have mentioned this before, you know, the old saying in radio, if you haven't been fired at least three times, you're not really in radio. So we may see more of that. But I'll tell you what my, my main takeaway from this, and it, it has been for a long time, is like you, I, uh, my world was changed when I discovered people like Mike Malloy, Tom Hartman, Norman Goldman, you know, Nicole Sandler, all these people that used to be on the Air America network or the Nova network in, in the case of Mike Malloy. And there are many more names that I could mention and you know who I'm talking about. Randy Rhodes, all these people. You cannot hear them on the radio in most places now. They are considered too controversial, let's face it. I mean, even public radio won't touch them. They will Tom Hartman, but they're not going to put Mike Malloy on a public radio station. Um, and they're not the only ones. Bob Kincaid head on Radio Network. Um, we Act in Washington, D.C. Jacob did a show with them. Um, radio or Not, Nicole Sandler, Jeff Santos out of Boston, Carl Wolfson in Portland, Ed Fallon in Iowa, in Des Moines. These are all people that are very independent, authentic people who really deserve an audience. And they deserve us to help get the word out about who they are. So if nothing else, um, I want those people who who actually lend, lend me a hand as well and put me on the air and help me with, with my work, they deserve a, a larger voice. And once again, I'm not saying that, you know, they should be, you know, sleeping in a palatial estate every night, a palatial estate every night. I'm just saying that they deserve more than what they're getting right now, that's for sure, because as far as I'm concerned, they're getting the shaft. And they've worked hard for years and years and years to do what they're doing. And they're, they're in there, they're struggling to survive. But if they don't get support from their audiences and somebody doesn't um, spread the word, they're in danger, all of them, even though they're, they are making the transition much better, by the way, than a lot of the right-wingers are to live streaming and using these social media networks. They're ahead of the curve, in reality, when it comes to what radio is turning into. Fox and the rest, they're a little bit behind. They're, it's still really hard for radio people to see themselves on a video. They're very self-conscious and they don't think of themselves as video, they think of themselves as audio. They also think that the tower that's broadcasting everywhere is the most important thing, and it's not. I keep trying to tell them that, but I know, you know very few of them will listen, except for maybe KEXP here in Seattle, who has listeners all over the world, by the way. Local radio stations, even like uh, our own local Pacifica affiliate, like KBCS or other stations, uh, they, they don't do much to reach out beyond the region. They consider themselves local, which is fine. But um, really, the, only, the reason that I got really interested in this group to begin with is because all of these people that I've been talking about tonight are doing amazing stuff and, and they need support and we need to do whatever it is. So maybe if the audience has more of a say-so in what the, what's happening on these networks and these programs, maybe they'll be less um, vulnerable, you know, because th it'll be harder for them to sell out because the audience is going to be saying, no, we won't support you. Right now, corporations take you off the air for money, not because they, you don't have an audience. Mike Malloy was, this was his number one rated place was Seattle. And Norman Goldman says the same thing. Wherever he goes, number one rating here, number one rating there. But it's not about ratings anymore. It's about stripping the radio stations down to nothing, firing everybody, automating everything, and getting back that money to give to the investors and to gain capital. So if if there was a number one status that we have with Malloy, Norman Goldman, I don't know about you folks, uh, I feel equally frustrated having this voice 1090 you know taken away from us and the frustration is was the alternative now and Julia I know you spearheaded a lot of this this effort to bring back terrestrial radio I don't know is it going to be in the AM format that's what's familiar to me and God, just so many options 
in terms of distribution. And Faraday now, as I said before, who was that voice? Yeah, I, I, Nicole Sandler's, yeah, I do know that. And she's waited with Randy. I mean, I'm doing all these calculations in my, my head for that maybe two or three hours a day that I'm commuting, listening, this background ambience. And I think that's it's just a frustration. Where do we t turn to for that particular last speaker? Where do we tend to turn into? And that's what I'm trying to calculate in my mind. So are you, are you saying, um, how do you find these yes. this programming? Yes. Well, literally, because we don't have the networks that we used to have, it's you have to go on online and literally find their website. That's really the only way that I know. Okay. With no, no, with Nicole Sandler's website or the, that network, radio or not, you can see on the sidebar these other programs. So it does bring it more in, onto one website. Um, so that's helpful. But literally, if there's a voice that you want to hear on the air these days, there is no central hub that I know of. Um, you can search for them on TuneIn Radio or iHeartRadio or other uh, live streaming platforms. And so then you could listen to it at one while they're live. Okay, I'm going to speak from the standpoint of a listener, all right? I, I have habits. I get in my, my car, I go I to Metro. It's time where my mind wanders. I don't like that. If I can turn on the radio and pick up Stephanie Miller and set the tone of my day with the, the, the mogs or mooks, you know, that's something I look forward to. On my commute back home, you know, I'm turning into Norman Goldman, you know, and I liked his particular format. It becomes a habit, but more than just a habit, it's also something that stirs me. It stimulates me to do action steps, to get involved with more progressive organizations, maybe in the city, or involved nationally. So, I guess that's what's upsetting to me is it was part of my habit. I, I, I would not love to have that, be able to make that deliberate decision to, you know, punch into my laptop, pull up, you know, Tom Hartman or uh, uh, half a dozen other folks that have been, you know, mentioned here tonight. But that's what I really miss. And is that lazy? I don't know. Um, <coughs> I just wish it was back. That's all. <laughs> Well, there's no reason that online websites can't do that. Um, there's no reason why, I mean, basically Radio or Not is like that. If you look at their schedule, you'll know, or you, if you look at each um, program, it'll tell you what time it's going to be on. So you can, I suppose if you're in your car, like Norman Golan was saying, you, you plug in into your audio, uh, into the speakers in your car, your audio device, and you, you, you know, enter Okay, it's three o'clock, so, or three o'clock, so Norman Goldman's on. So you type in normangoldman.com, goes to the site, you see the live stream link, and you hit it. Now you've got video if you want to look at it, but when you're driving, you know, you can listen to it. Uh, what I do, and I've, probably what other folks do, is I literally, uh, I know, well, I know these programs really well, like you all did. I still know what time they're live. So I just search for them when I know they're live. So I know that Norman Goldman is on three to six. I know that Mike Malloy, this is Pacific time. I know Mike Malloy is still on six to nine. Um, I know Carl Wolfson on, on uh, the X-ray uh, station down in Portland is on at seven to nine a.m. So once I get the schedule in my head, then I know who I'm gonna listen to at what time. And you know, maybe sometimes I'll skip and do something else not that day. But uh, uh, that's what I do. I just, I do the same thing, but it just takes a little bit more back research to find out. You go to their website, you find out what their schedule is. If it says Eastern time, you, you know, subtract three hours. <laughs> and it's not as easy necessarily as just um, turning on a station, but it could be that. I mean, there's no reason why, you know, a website like GRIW or another website could be a place where there would be live streaming 24-7. Free speech TV does that. You get video all 24-7. Um, 
There's no reason why a website can't do that. And Free Speech TV is just a website, basically, with a live streaming video. That's where you can watch Tom Hartman from noon to three every day. So I, you can see, I have my day scheduled out. <laughs> Carl Wilson in the morning, and I guess somebody, um, Jacob was talking about Klugman? Adam Klugman. Adam, Adam Klugman, there's another person we should really plug in that people should listen to. He's on after that. I know that Tom's gonna be on at noon, Norma Goldman's gonna be on at three, Mike Moy's gonna be on. Now, for me, it's probably easy to memorize these schedules because sometimes I have to go on air with them and stuff, so I, I, I know what time I'm supposed to call in or whatever, but uh, I just, now it's in my head, so I can't get it out. I know when they're gonna be on. I still probably, you're right though, I still probably don't just, I don't just go to the computer, hit a button, and listen for the rest of the day like I used to. You know? It might not be just hitting the button, but it's 24-7, that's what 1090 was. Yeah. It's like, it's like macaroni and cheese, so it's like meatloaf, it's, like, it's a comfort food. Yeah. You know? Seriously though, there's no reason why tonight someone couldn't go home, create a website, and link to their live stream to all of those programs on one website, and then you could just go there and, it, and the same thing would happen if, well, if those programs would agree to allow, allow you to do that, I suppose, right? But if they would, there's no reason why, you know, anybody could set this up, basically. You, you just go to the website and you see the schedule and each one of these programs is streaming at a different time. So what time is it? Well, here's the thing is how do you link them together? I guess that way you would have to literally have a link to their website to do the live stream, right? Um, or the other way is that from three to six is here, from six to nine is there, you just click on it. So the one program ends, the only thing is you have to go back to your computer and click on the next one. Or maybe, no, you could, set, you could automate it so that it would just automatically go and turn on the next link. So there's no reason, and I don't know why people, why this isn't happening, but barring any kind of licensing fees that some programs might want to charge you if they're commercial, I don't see any reason why that can't be done right now. I know what the links are to those websites. In fact, I know what the links are to that particular live stream URL. So I could just paste them in a document, make them a link, and any time of day, somebody could go there and hit it and listen to them when they're on the air. So. We're actually working at adapting the uh, Progressive Radio Northwest website to do just that. Um, we started um, very preliminary. Just uh, we figured out we can stream, yay, you know, uh, live content like the Travis Chicago Progressive Station. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned. I mean, that's going to be a step towards, you know, the larger goal of uh, some kind of terrestrial station with um, supporting digital technologies. So. Yes, well, that is a virtual radio station, actually. Yeah. I, I support both. I support terrestrial radio and online. Just real quickly, I think we're about ready to wrap up, right? Yeah, okay. get, get closer, but uh, yeah, if you go online and just look up uh, Russell Radio Stations, there's a great one in Chicago, a great one out of Phoenix, and they run the same thing, Ed Schultz, uh, Stephanie Miller, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's a really easy way to do it. Just take your smartphone, plug it in your car, and you can listen to it anytime. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, the trick is having a smartphone that can do that. We at Space Dog Radio, we pride ourselves on doing uh, independent broadcasts fully remotely. We call ourselves a remote location radio station, which means you can listen to us anywhere, anytime if you've got online access. And that gives you the ability to choose whatever program you want to hear. We're not forcing you to hear anything. We actually did a broadcast on a ferry boat and a video of it going through Orcas by Orcas Island where we're playing the radio literally and there's, there's nothing to it. It's broadcasting right from the car. So it's, it's definitely possible, and uh, it just, I think a really good point here is it's going to take a paradigm shift with listeners to kind of take that extra step. Yes, you have to plug in your smartphone, and yes, you kind of have to know the website, but after that, it's going to be as easy as what you usually do now is just turning the dial. So once once listeners kind of get that change going, then, they, then they've got a whole new access to listenership. I would just add really quickly uh, for time uh, to ask yourself why did KPTK and KPOJ and Green 960 disappear? Um, it, it's very simple. Corporate media 
mainstream media, commercial radio, is not going to air or promote or sustain anything that would work against its own best interest, like progressive radio. And two, most potential advertisers or potential investors, especially corporate donors, Walmart, BP, GE, are not going to endorse something that is often critiquing themselves and powerful public figures and the corporate stake take over of democracy. So the reality is, is terrestrial radio costs a lot of money, millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. And, you know, uh, where is that money going to come from? So what is the alternative? You look at nonprofit community based radio stations that are that are listener supported. You've got uh, uh, what is it, KEXP in Seattle. You've got um, uh, the news station down in Portland is X-Ray, X-Ray FM. And they just said, hey, we want to do a, a progressive radio station on the air in Portland. Can you give us some money? They got $100,000. You think $100,000 would be a lot of money to put together a radio station. They, their signal is so weak, I'm telling you, that you can only pick it up in like maybe one or two neighborhoods in Portland. You go anywhere farther west uh, than I-5 and 26, or you go farther north than 84, and you've lost the signal. And that's $100,000. So the reality is, is terrestrial radio is very expensive. And unless we've got a, you know, BP or Walmart to back us, which I doubt that's going to happen, we're going to really have to find that alternative. I want, want to say one quick thing about the programming. People used to look at the TV guide, right? The only difference now is that instead of four or five channels, you've got a thousand million. So it's the same process. Uh, you look at the TV guide and you go, do I want to watch this as ABC News or CBS News or NBC News? Well, now you just go, do I want to go to ABC News website, CBS News website? Um, but that was an excellent point, and I should have mentioned that. Uh, I listen to a lot of this, these programs actually on other radio stations that still are programming them, that are still doing progressive radio. One of them out of Phoenix, Arizona is KPHX. They stream all, almost all of these people we've mentioned tonight that have been taken off the air other places. And a lot of, before I started watching Free Speech TV, where I can actually see Tom Hartman on the air, I used to listen to him on a station out of Colorado. There's also a progressive station in Chicago. So. All you have to do, really, is go to their website, hit the live button, and you can listen to it all day long, these same people. The sad part is, is that there are fewer and fewer of them out there, but you can find them. You don't have to be near the radio station. I, should have, I really should have mentioned that, because that's really important. Uh, my name's Norm Conrad. Uh, three points. One thing I heard most of you talk about was transition and this is where we're moving where media is going whatever well i am one who is mostly interested in social change and that's all useful but what about the present you know right now we're dealing with as we all know here uh, a media environment that is essentially hostile to virtually anything and everything progressives like, want, etc. So the question then becomes, number one, how do we get information to folks who aren't willing to do this paradigm shift of punching buttons, going through this, that, and the other thing, who want to go into their homes, into their cars, and let it wash over them. And right now we have nothing. The second thing is, um, all of the, the, whether it's the internet or anything else, this is, these are media that essentially require self-selection. I have to know what it is I'm going for. And unfortunately, we have a country, as we all know, that, is, that has been, over the last 40 years, systematically idiotized. And getting us to reach for specific things is fine as long as you're already there. Most of us aren't already there. You know, I don't need a medium to speak to the choir. I need a medium to talk to the folks that aren't even in the hall, that don't know what's going on, 
and frankly right now don't even know they care about what's going on. I, I wish I had a different answer for you, but today, if you want to listen to that wash of sound of all these progressive voices, the only way you're going to get it is off of your computer or your smartphone by going to KPHX in Phoenix at that website. But once you do that and you press the live streaming button, uh, it's theirs all. It's yours all day, 24/7. That's all you have to do. Unfortunately, there isn't. Uh, only Tom Hartman is left in Seattle, and that's it, on KVCS. And unfortunately, like KX, K, KXR. KXP, I, I. No, uh, uh, the the Portland station. Actually, it's a it's it's a bigger it's a it's a bigger signal, and I guess they are investing uh, money in a brand new tower, which will make their s signal even bigger. But it's still difficult to hear Tom Hartman in downtown Seattle and parts of Seattle because it's being broadcast from Bellevue. That's where KVCS is. North side, uh, near Snohomish, gone. You can't, it's not available up there. And also, what we've been discussing here, this is a whole other issue, but there's there's public radio versus commercial progressive radio, which is what we have all been talking about. And it is a different ethic, and it's a different group of people. Unfortunately, we're finding that there's competition between the public radio audience and these progressive shows. So when I say Tom Hartman is on KBCS, um, the rest of their program, you won't hear Norman Goldwyn, you're not going to hear Mike Mendel, you're not going to hear anyone else. So the only way you can do that in Seattle right now is find a station like KPHX in, Port, in uh, Phoenix and use your smartphone or your laptop. That's, that's my only answer. I wish I had a better one. I wish you could just tune in. Um, but you, you have a good point you know, about wanting that, wanting to be able to access it easily. Part of it might be that the technology hasn't quite caught up, so maybe in the future you will have this thing in your car. I mean, now they use satellite radio and things, but there will be ways of doing that. Well, of course, my point is that uh, right now, I don't know how long any of us have available to wait. You know, I mean, the ship is hitting the sand. The reef is out there, in my opinion, whether it's uh, climate change or any one of a hundred other things. And the question is, in my mind, do we have the luxury of waiting for technology to catch up to people who at this point have spent the last 10, 15 years brainwashed by Hannity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How do we get our, well, not our, how do we get reality into the Fox household? Into the household where if you happen to live, whether it's uh, Moses Lake here in Washington, or Walla Walla, or um, any one of a hundred other communities east of the mountains, or for that matter somewhere in between Olympia and Vancouver, uh, how do you get those people an option, an ability to not spend five hours a day trying to find something, but something they can quickly and easily get to real information that, in fact, will change worldviews. That, that is also an amazing point. You're right, actually. Because what you're talking about is an issue we hadn't really covered, which is, yes, how, how do you reach people who could really be affected by this information who have never heard it before? You guys have... I would, I would say, you know, it's a tragedy that the people who the people who most need to hear this message are the people that don't hear it at all, right? That's the problem. And I think um, this is where that grassroots activism actually showing up, being in the streets, demonstrating, not violently protesting, putting a, a, a physical location and a physical actual demonstration into motion so people can see that, bring it to their doorsteps. I mean, I mean be respectful, be professional, be nonviolent. But show up and get active and get in the streets. I mean, that's that's my solution. Unfortunately, this is Seattle. <laughs> Seattleites <laughs> don't do that. No one does. I mean, and you're, you're probably right. I mean, there are a, a dozen, two dozen, five dozen of us activists who have been trying to get people out to do anything. And, you know, 
progressives have hemmed themselves into so many little, narrow, tiny niches and silos that, oh, I'm an, environment, I'm an environmentalist, but I'm only concerned about orcas. I'm an environmentalist, but I only care about panthers in Florida or whatever. I mean, you can, you can take this to any extreme in any particular general field. We have put ourselves into so many different camps, and we never talk to each other. We need top down is what we need. <laughs> I, I think what you're talking about is populism, which is the only answer that I've come up with is, yes, we are progressive, but if we're going to reach out to everyone, then we have to have a populist message. A Jim Hightower would be a great example of that, somebody who's just telling the truth. And we also, we've lost the accidental listeners that you would get from terrestrial radio, which is part of why people don't necessarily get introduced to this information, because you have to go to that specific website. The only people that want to uh, broadcast or publish the reports, and the reporting that I do, are going to be progressive. So there you go, I'm stuck in my own niche, you know. I don't know how to get it to those other people. That's why we all want to spread the word as far and wide as possible. And then the question is, you know, how do you do that and still stay authentic? The corporations could broadcast us everywhere, but will they let us say what we need to say? So we need to find new models that can get around that. I just have one quick comment, I'll be sure. Um, one thing we found is that, uh, you know, us persistent inquiring uh, progressive nerds can go out and find all this shit and we get pretty well informed about it. But the great unwashed masses out there don't, know, don't have a clue where to look. And one scheme that we have found, and we posted on our website at Meaningful Movies, is yeah, should keep it up better and augment it a little more. But basically, just give a reference. You know, Lakoff says you got to hit to the guts, you got to hit music, you got to hit comedy, you got to hit interesting people. Well, list the sites that have this, what their specialty is, whether they're, uh, you know, Huffington Post. Uh, uh, garbage stuff, but it's current, they can go in and get the news, or whether it's deep inquiry like uh, consortium news, where they're, uh, you know, got experts looking in depth at uh, history and current events, or it's a comedy to, to, to get right at the guts of your right-wing relatives, whether, they, whether they'll listen to anybody from the left for more than five seconds or not, it'll hit them. But anyway, provide the list of, of what these sources are, have it available to them, and, and so the unwashed masses can go out and find them without going to so much trouble or spending so much time. Thank you.